The German community in Scotland was part of a wider outflow of German migrants uh, across the world, actually. For Britain, we are talking about roughly 100,000 Germans. Uh, and for Scotland, and this is a direct link to the First World War when uh, Germans uh, had to register with the police stations and the numbers we get there for Scotland are around 3,000 for the whole of Scotland uh, translate, uh, translates into uh, about 1,000 for Glasgow and about 700 for Edinburgh. So relatively low numbers uh, but these numbers were obviously blown up after the outbreak of war when they perceived, were perceived as a danger to internal security. Um, in terms of popular perception, um, spy novels became very, very uh, powerful um, instruments to, to convey that uh, message of an internal threat. Uh, William Lecoeur, for, for example, or Erskine Childers, all writing uh, spy novels called The Riddle in the Sands or When the Kaiser Came to Britain. And the gist of these novels uh, was really Germans coming over to Britain um, disguising as innocent barbers, musicians, academics, just uh, people in the street, uh, but in fact actually being spies of the Kaiser. So there had been some violence before, just after the outbreak of war, and this really came in waves. Uh, this was in August 1914, after the outbreak of war, small-scale violence. Uh, then towards the end, from September, October uh, 1914 onwards as well, when the first um, instances of German atrocities in Belgium, messages about this came across the channel, the, the British public was fed by that, and then that was kind of a second wave. But then, as you just mentioned, the third and really biggest wave uh, during the war that was um, after the 7th of May 1915, in the next few uh, weeks when the uh, passenger line in Lusitania was sunk uh, at the Irish Channel uh, with uh, hundreds of loss of life of both Americans and, uh, and, and English. Uh, and this was really a tipping point and this uh, was really followed by large-scale rioting uh, against German uh, owned uh, premises, mostly in London, mostly in the East End in London, but also in Manchester and in Liverpool. Um, in Scotland, we have comparably fewer riots of this kind, uh, which can possibly be explained by lower numbers. The processes I've just described have been tackled by research um, over the last few years, uh, but with regard to Scotland, very little has been done in terms of research, and the Scottish self-perception of historically always being more open to foreigners, more tolerant, more welcoming, uh, I think when you really look at the data and the occurrences during the First World War, uh, this picture really changes. Uh, I, th I would think the, the same patterns that applied elsewhere in England and across the British Empire also applied to Scotland um, with these xenophobic, germanophobic tendencies uh, being prevalent within Scotland as well. First, Germans or enemy aliens, as they were called, that was the official uh, term for them, were actually interned right in the, the first few weeks after the outbreak of war from 1914, August 1914 uh, onwards. Uh, but it's, it's really from May 1915 that there was a, a policy of wholesale internment of enemy aliens. Um, in terms of numbers, um, the largest camp was on the Isle of Man, uh, the, the name was Nokalo, uh, which held 23,000 enemy aliens. So that's quite a medium-sized town in a way, uh, all in internment camps, uh, which if you look at uh, foot old photographs and, and pictures, uh, they pretty much look like all the internment camps we we, we know from the 20th century, whether in Russia or in the United States or in Germany, indeed, it was actually Britain as a, an allegedly liberal empire st standing at the forefront of interning uh, civilians. I just mentioned Russia. These were not Russian gulags. They were not punishment camps. Nobody was punished. Nobody was forced to work. Um, the inmates were treated relatively well. Um, now, one can explain this. One, one could 
spontaneously think uh, that uh, Britain was a relatively or comparably humanitarian nation treating their prisoners well, but if you take into account the aspect of reciprocity, uh, then a different picture emerges because Brits lived in Germany as well. Uh, now the better the British government treated their enemy aliens, the better they knew the Germans would treat the British as well. So there was a constant kind of comparing between the two nations. Uh, who, who treats their prisoners better? Do we or do the others? Um, and there's the other element of this being thought as a just war. In order to mobilize the masses and convince the masses to actually go to the front and enlist and fight for the nation, uh, one had to convey the picture of this being a just war. Now, civilians being locked away and mistreated wouldn't have fitted into that picture. It was only males, so women were not interned, at least not on the, in, in, within Britain. It was a slightly different story in the colonies. And only uh, non-naturalized Germans. So those who had moved to Britain and had not applied for a British passport. Those who were naturalized were not interned. There was a lot of popular pressure to have also those who held a British pa passport interned mm -hmm. um, as being equally malicious, dangerous, uh, spy prone as those who, who hadn't been. In terms of families being torn apart, yes, they were torn apart because the male breadwinner was interned, sometimes for, for four or five years, uh, and the women got some but very little support from the state uh, and um, uh, were really very poor, uh, poor off. What was life like in the camps? How did internees actually spend their days? Um, what was the barbed wire disease? Uh, that's a condition that, uh, that came up in these camps, that the boredom, the lack of things to do over four or five years uh, whilst you're professional existence and your family life was slipping away and you had no way of finding out how things are actually going in your company, with your employer, with your family. Um, and the term coined was the barbed wire disease, that particular kind, uh, kind of depression. Um, the name of that disease, the name or the term uh, was coined by a Swiss psychiatrist, uh, Fischer, who was one of those who inspected camps throughout the British Empire, who wrote about this and came across something that just hadn't existed before because the very concept of civilian internment over prolonged periods just hadn't been there in history. It's actually one uh, quite moving story by a German-American um, who had moved to, uh, from Germany to the United States in the 1890s, uh, was a medical doctor um, and was just about to be naturalized in the United States. He already had applied for naturalization. Um, then he traveled back in August 1914, wanted to travel back from the United States to, to Germany to visit friends and family there, and then the war broke out and he was apprehended, uh, then sent to the Storps camp in Scotland um, uh, because he was still technically a German citizen. Um, and he um, was got then so depressed that uh, in 1917, I think, uh, he injected an overdose of morphine and uh, and committed suicide, but between injecting that overdose and actually dying, he wrote quite a moving uh, farewell letter. It was difficult for those who were released from imprisonment um, to move back into their communities uh, and live again with the neighbors who had shown so much animosity towards them. Um, and in terms of the ethnic structures, uh, they never really uh, recovered from the shock of the First World War.